And this turns RB26's arguably one of the most popular engines to come out of Japan. And there's a million different combinations of build you can do on an RB26, anything from 600 horsepower up to several thousand. So there isn't one right formula. But we're here with Herman from Platinum Racing Products to talk about his own personal RB26 sitting here behind me, find out a little bit more about his philosophy on building the ultimate RB26 street engine. So. Herman, when we're talking about street engines, it's not necessarily all about peak power, is it? It's also drivability. What's important to you? Look, I've always said for a street car, 800 horsepower, it's mint. You go to 1,000, you start bringing on problems, and it's not your everyday sort of driver. It's wild and dangerous. You know, on the street, personally, I don't like 1,000. On the track, well, it's not enough. So, you know, you need 1,500 on the on the track, and for the street, 7 800, it's just a mint combo. Okay, so can we literally get the best of both worlds? Obviously, we have boost control. Obviously, we have the ability to change fuels, pump gas to E85 to perhaps methanol. So can you get a, a combination that basically is perfect for both, both, both conditions? Yeah, absolutely. But I think to do it properly, you've got two turbos. And if you can put them on V-bands and swap them out and race with one and street drive the other, that's the way I would do it personally. The issue here is essentially if you've got a turbo that can support 1500 horsepower and race trim, you're going to be severely compromised on the street. And when I say compromised, I'm talking you're going to have poor boost response, correct? Yeah, it's going to be a bit of a dog. These days, I mean, it's not a five minute job to change turbos, but when we're talking V-bands, it's also not the biggest chore in the world. It's getting better. Yeah, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, you can swap a turbo. It's faster than me, but we'll take that. Mm. All right, let's talk about engine combinations because as I mentioned, there's literally dozens of combos on the RB platform that we can use. The RB26 block versus the RB30. Can you give us your take on pros and cons of each? The RB30 block, I've never been a real big fan of. It's taller and it's awkward to fit and you've got to change everything. So I thought, why not develop an RB30 in a short deck block, and then you're not suffering the consequences of a poor Conrad ratio. Um, you could just do it with a bigger piston. So we've chosen a 79 mil crank, 90 mil piston, 1.55 to one ratio, which gives you the best of all of those worlds. You get a nice sounding engine, you get throttle response torque, you get, you get power. Um, so you're not compromising RPM either. So why not put an RB30 into a short deck 26? So conventionally that's done with a longer stroke crankshaft to get the capacity. You're doing it with more a larger bore piston. Well, both. I mean, 73.7 standard, yeah, and then 79, um, usually a, a 2.8 would be 77.7. We've gone to a 79. So, yeah, it is a stroker and about as big as you want to go on a short deck, but we've also increased the deck height by 2.65 millimetres to make that rod ratio work and stop the piston hitting the, crown, uh, the crank counterweights. How, how are you adding that 2.65 millimetres to the deck height? Well, we just basically cast it with 5 mil extra on top and you machine it back to where you need it. So you can set it up to essentially, within reason, whatever you want. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, talking about the internal componentry to, to handle that sort of strength, that sort of power level, what, what are you running there? Uh, look, we're working on our own crankshafts. Uh, we're also working with Cali's on a wide journal version. But um, a standard sort of billet crank for a 26 is still a good combo. Pistons and rods, obviously, we, we support and use um, IRP, but there's so, several brands that make a nice piston and rod. Uh, and then you go to the to a stroker, and then obviously you can still go a 2.8 or 2.9 or third, put whatever you want in it. But the versatility is there because you can punch out that bore size to over 90 millimetres and still have the structural integrity. So you're still at 90 millimetres, you've still got sufficient uh, thickness in the bores to, to be reliable. Essentially, that's the key there. That's the key, yeah, absolutely. Something you can't do on a stock rock. No, and, and increasing the deck height, I mean, it blows your mind that you can just go and do that from a rough casting because we've always been limited to a certain deck height. You can make a thicker head gasket sort of kind of work, but it's not right. Um, so it just opens up a new dimension of setting an engine up however you want because you've got the versatility from a casting, you know, raw casting. So with that raw casting, are you providing it essentially like that, raw and then it will be decked to provide the deck height that the builder wants, or do you provide it in multiple different deck heights? Well, look, we'll have obviously standard and then our 2.65, uh, but our aim is to provide a totally machined block to a bore size, not honed, um, but then we're doing the main tunnel and finishing it all off. So if someone wanted a specific deck height, uh, it'll be a custom order and we can do that. 
Uh, in terms of the cylinder head, because this is really one of the keys to the performance of the engine, the capacity is obviously important, but getting the airflow in and out of the engine is really up to the cylinder head. What, what needs to be done with an RB26 head? Look, porting has always been an issue because you go too big and you run out of port, basically. Um, there's two versions of cylinder head that we've done. One satisfies the OEM and mild porting, one mil oversized valve. And then we go to our R1 version, which will support up to a 37 millimeter valve, wild porting. It's got a raised exhaust um, port. It's got a 35 millimeter bucket as opposed to 31. So you can swing a 13 millimeter cam if you want it. It just opens up a whole new world of tunability with aftermarket parts to make the head and engine flow more. Let's talk about that that bucket. This is a, a, a shim under bucket sort of a, yeah. approach, which is, is great and reliable. It's a mechanical system, no hydraulic lifters. But as you mentioned there, the diameter of the, the factory bucket can be limiting in terms of uh, what cam profile you can run. What, why does that limit the cam profile? Just because where the cam comes around, you don't want it to, to kick the bucket. So if you're off center too much, you start running into problems and you can't really move the bucket bore to compensate it in a standard one so moving it out to a 35 mil bucket it's actually an r35 gtr vr38 bucket it's off the shelf so you can put that in and all of a sudden you get an extra few millimeters of cam lift if you want it and you're not going to compromise it the other problem with the stock head of course is for even a reasonable size cam you you have to actually clearance the head so that the cam load can swing I take it, not an issue with your head? Yeah, everything's done. All those niggly bits, um, we machine out the oil galleries and give you bungs, um, high lift cam, porting, you can have up to a 90 mil ball, which satisfies the, the bigger 90 mil piston type, type situation with the material around the combustion chamber to support 90. Because a lot of guys go to a 90 mil ball, but then they start cracking heads because there's no support underneath the squish area on the exhaust side specifically. So there's always these knock-on effects that you yeah. don't necessarily know about until you're actually yeah. too deep into yeah. it. And then with the stock head, there's no solution to that problem. You've already spent the money and you're kind of stuck with a 90 mil ball, yeah. Now, head gasket ceiling is another issue with any highly strung turbocharged engine. How does your aftermarket block and head sort of address that? Is, the, is this coming down to just additional thickness in the deck surface of the block and the cylinder head? Pretty much. I mean, the way I see it, all aftermarket gaskets that have new tech and different rings and fire rings and piano wire and all that sort of stuff, it's because there's a bigger issue. So the deck's flexing or the head deck is flexing, but if you've got 12 and a half mil roughly on both, they're not flexing and MLS should do the job. Just coming back to the, the street versus race application, one of the novel aspects you've got on this engine is a dual fuel system. Can you just talk us through what that actually entails and why you've gone that way? This is a, a personal engine and I just like playing with things. So I set up years ago a dual fuel because I wanted to run ethanol in the primary rail and then methanol in the secondary and blend at 10% every thousand RPM until it's on full song. So I could sit at a set of traffic lights and not let anyone know I was burning meth, you know? So um, playing around with fuels and nitro and stuff has always been really interesting because it makes a massive difference. So that's why it was just to be able to play with it at some point and now on an engine dyno, why not have a couple of pumps and different rails so you can do that? Yeah, I mean, this also could be used for maybe a more conventional pump gas to drive around town and then E85, or as you mentioned, methanol, basically the sky's the limit there. Need a special control strategy with your ECU though to handle that, correct? Yeah, you do. It does get a little tricky and uh, I did hurt an engine not doing that properly the first time. So this time we've invested a bit more money and uh, we're also playing around with uh, cylinder pressure equipment. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll learn a lot more about it, especially testing our new combos and heads and cam packages. Uh, another part with that dual fuel system is quite obviously you've got two Kinsler mechanical pumps fitted to this engine. I Back in the day, I'd say that was almost an essential. The electric fuel pumps really just weren't there. And to get the fuel flow for a lot of power draws a lot of current. These days, brushless pumps, it's maybe a little bit easier to go with, with that, that route. So uh, interested why the, the drive towards the mechanical pump? We started selling mechanical fuel pump systems early on, uh, especially offering Kinsler. We've never had a failure and no one has ever heard an engine with a mechanical fuel pump. So it's it's like with a zero failure, and even to this day, Kinsler's never had a failure in the field. It's just a no-brainer. They, they turn at engine speed, so they're not doing anything at idle. And the more you need the pump, the more the engine's revving anyway. You're not heating fuel unnecessarily. It's just a no-brainer. It works. 
All right, let's just talk a little bit about the combo you've got behind me because it is actually on a dyno trolley. So this at the moment, factory block and head, using this as a development to test your uh, aftermarket cast block and head. How are you going through that process? What's your, your intended process with it? So we just finished machining our new block and head yesterday, coincidentally. We just needed to do some oil galleries, but it's all board and line board and everything, it's done. So next week, hopefully I'll be building an engine. But instead of murdering a new engine without having data, I thought I'll put my engine on the dyno, which is still a fresh engine, but we'll tune it up, get a baseline, know what the RB is supposed to be doing with a 26 on an engine dyno. And once we've got the data in the tune, then we'll swap over a long, a long motor and basically we'll have a starting po point to just start running it up and have data to compare it to. So a somewhat scientific approach where literally the only thing you're going to be changing is the long motor and you'll be able to test back to back and see where the differences lie. I'm guessing then there's going to be some torture testing to really put this new yeah, combination through its through its paces? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a bottom end doesn't give you power. It's just got to hang in there. So if anything, we are back to back testing our head. Uh, obviously, we'll do all the you know longevity testing and put it under pressure and wind it up. But initially, just to get it up and running and check the coolant pressures and and temperatures all through the head, make sure we've got proper flow through all the areas that you can't see. Um, working alongside with the block because we made a lot of changes with the head heaps and a lot of changes to the block. Working together, they need to work in unison. We had to do it so you could still run an OEM head or an OEM block with either one. So we've got to test all those combinations and make sure we've got it right across the board. I guess as usual, even the, the best laid plans, you still have to actually put them through the paces and make sure that everything that you thought's gonna work in theory does actually pan out in reality. Uh, look, early days at the moment, Herman, it's a shame we weren't a little bit further along the path by the time we got to have a chat to you, but uh, there's always next time. Uh, we look forward to hearing exactly how that combination goes. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.